Our speaker will tell you about the status of coordinated vulnerability disclosure worldwide with a, spe a special focus um, of, uh, on the Netherlands. And he has several years of experience uh, working in this process, which we will talk to you, uh, tell you all about it. Uh, Jeroen van der Ham is a researcher at uh, the National Cybersecurity Center in the Netherlands. Um, he is organizing Science for Sha for this festival, so maybe we can give him a short round of applause just for organizing Science for Sha. <laughs> Woo! Uh, his interests include ethics and coordinated vulnerability disclosure, and if you meet him for a beer, please ask him about the performance of the Dutch Postal Services leading up to this uh, event. He has some great stories about that. But uh, for, for now, um, please give it up for Jeroen, who's going to talk about uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Thank you, thank you. So yes, um, my name is Jeroen van der Ham. I work for the government. Um, and I'm actually here to help to tell you how the government can help you. Um, yes, I'm, I'm really serious. Um, so, first off, um, who here has done um, uh, disclosures of uh, uh, security vulnerabilities? There's a few hands there. And who's from the Netherlands? There's a, okay, there's a difference in the set. Um, and that affects you, and um, uh, I'll, I'll be talking about how we've, we've been doing uh, vulnerability disclosure policies in the Netherlands. Um, and also, uh, I'll have some good news about international developments uh, uh, and can tell you more about that. So first off, we all know that everybody has vulnerabilities. Um, and the important thing, the important message that I'm trying to convey is that what, what's most important is how, you, how you're able to receive them uh, and act on them. Uh, because that is how, uh, uh, af what affects most of the security in the process. So, we have vulnerability disclosure. Um, the, the, useful, the, the most common term uh, for it, the, the process these days is coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Um, the idea is that you work with vendors to fix vulnerabilities before they are disclosed. There are a couple of phases. You report, there's triage, there's development of the, of the fix, and then there's the deployment of the fix. Um, and it's important for organizations to realize that there are these four phases, but it's also important for the disclosers to uh, realize that there's these uh, phases. Um, and the uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure happens before this whole process. Um, there has been a disagreement, there has been debate, and there has been some agreement um, on disclosure of bugs in the last 30 years. Uh, we've been doing this for, for this long. Um, um, first, there was full disclosure, then there was discussion, and now we're at responsible or coordinated. And we're seeing some more trends towards coordinated because it puts less of a, of a, um, a value on the, uh, on the behavior of the discloser. Um, and uh, of course, there's a lot of discussion what kind of information to whom and when. Um, there's also a lot of discussion about how long to wait for the, for the vendor to actually fix stuff. These are all still open questions, unfortunately, and uh, I think the debate just has to evolve um, uh, so that we can actually find questions, uh, find answers to these questions. Um, the governments didn't pay that much attention uh, to vulnerability disclosure in the last 30 years um, until everything became a connected computer. Um, and now, in the last few years, we're seeing even more developments now that transportation, healthcare, manufacturing, um, we see, we're seeing self-driving cars, uh, we're seeing pacemakers that are, that are vulnerable, we're seeing uh, uh, lots of ICS stuff that is completely vulnerable, um, and you're also seeing some kind of liability for software uh, systems, or at least there is some discussion on it. Um, and, uh, well, yeah, the, the examples, there's even toilets that have been disclosures. Uh, on toilets, I'm serious. Um, and um, 
there have been national and international efforts to actually discuss vulnerability disclosure and the, the, how this affects the disclosures. The, um, I'm happy to report that there have been many, many uh, international involvement, uh, in initiatives and guidelines. The first one on the left is actually in 2013, the NCC in the Netherlands, they published a, a guideline for how to uh, uh, create and publish a vulnerability disclosure uh, program, uh, uh, still called the Responsible Disclosure Program. Um, and it included a way for hackers to, um, to act, to do their research, to figure out what the vulnerability was, how to report it to the vendor or the, the affected organization in such a way that they would not be prosecuted. Uh, either by the organization or by the government, even. Um, uh, there's also been a, um, a, a standard. Um, there's actually a standard. It's published by the International uh, Standards Organization, ISO uh, uh, 29147. Um, and it's actually available for free. So um, uh, just at the beginning of last year, it was made available for free. It describes the, the process of reporting a vulnerability without putting any... Um, uh, um, it, it doesn't say much about a prosecution, but it at least describes the process of what you should do when you receive a, a vulnerability disclosure. Um, uh, the other standard, 30111, is a uh, description of what the internal process should look like when, you, when you're fixing a vulnerability disclosure, uh, or when you're fixing a, a security uh, vulnerability. Um, that one is unfortunately not free, but it's mostly aimed at organizations and not at uh, uh, disclosures. Um, there has been an initiative um, called uh, uh, at um, the Global Conference on Cyberspace, the GCCS, that was in 2015. We helped re prepare a document there describing the, all the issues around vulnerability disclosure. The European Network and Information Security Agency, the ENISA, um, also looked into all of these issues. They, they identified this as being a very important issue and they uh, also published a statement describing all of the efforts going on and um, uh, saying that this is actually a good thing. Um, so that's mostly European. Um, over on the other side of the pond, the NTIA is um, a department that, um, that's also the, the department that was involved in, in regulating the, uh, or uh, governing the internet, the ICANN function. Uh, but another part of the NTIA was actually talking to people, they, they did a uh, multi-stakeholder process. Um, they invited uh, security researchers, they invited organizations, um, uh, uh, bug bounty uh, companies, um, uh, government, everybody, and they, did, they talked about how to do vulnerability disclosure and what the challenges were in vulnerability disclosure. And they uh, published actually four different documents saying, how to do the vulnerability disclosure. They did a uh, research on what, um, uh, what kind of people and what kind of attitudes the, the security researchers have. Uh, this was actually a very awesome study that ha I have a graph at the end of the, uh, the presentation to show you what the results are. Um, they looked at uh, companies that, that did uh, vulnerability disclosure. Um, and there was a fourth one uh, oh, yes, um, they also described a more complex process in what happens when you have to do a coordination between several different uh, kinds, uh, several different organizations when they are affected by the same security vulnerability and they have to coordinate to all fix at the same time. Um, and just in time for my presentation here, you wouldn't expect it, but the Department, U.S. Department of Justice has just published a, a framework document last week on how to do uh, vulnerability disclosure, and they even included some statements saying how you can frame this in the same way that the Netherlands did, is they created some sort of legal loophole that uh, companies can actually make sure that the, the disclosures are not uh, prosecuted. Um, the Department of Justice did the same thing, saying this is the stuff that you can put in your policy to make sure that the security researchers are safe from prosecution. So I think that that is really an excellent development. Um, 
since the introduction in 2013 in the Netherlands, there has been, it has been a huge success. Um, this is just a small selection of companies in the Netherlands that, that have a responsible disclosure guideline published. Um, and it ranges from security companies like Fox IT, um, uh, ISPs like Access, Access for All, um, but even DIY stores, um, uh, banks, um, uh, municipalities, um, water companies, um, um, news blogs, any kind of uh, 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 organization uh, is represented in this uh, and actually has a responsible disclosure program. Um, and these companies, they actually are very positive about this development and they even went so far as to come together themselves and they wanted to, to express their enthusiasm and they wanted to, to publish their enthusiasm about the uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure and they wrote a manifesto saying uh, these companies we support the idea of vulnerability disclosure. We want to promote this idea. And they um, got on stage during the uh, EU presidency of the, of the Netherlands last year um, and um, put out to the world that they were supporting this idea. Meanwhile, we also have a big development. The, the vulnerability disclosure programs have become so successful and so popular that there are actually companies springing up right now um, and filling the void in helping other organizations do vulnerability disclosure. There's HackerOne, there's BugCrowd, there's uh, Synac, and there's uh, ZeroCopter, um, who are represented here today. Um, and um, they, these companies help you uh, help other organizations set up bug bounty programs or, or just simple vulnerability disclosure programs. Um, and I think that that is a very uh, important uh, development. Um, let's see. Um, uh, oh, I wanted to point out, if you have questions at, at any point, I can take questions during the, during the talk, or if you have uh, questions about vulnerability disclosure policies, I'm happy to take them. Um, so I've been talking about a lot of positive developments. There have been, unfortunately, also some negative developments, and they also came from the Netherlands um, in a town called... Uh, they, they started, actually, in a town called Wassenaar. Um, they don't actually reside in the, the, the town of Wassenaar anymore, but they, they're in uh, Vienna these days. And this is actually the Wassenaar arrangement for export controls of conventional arms and dual-use goods and technology. So this is a whole mouthful. What does that mean? This is the way that uh, 41 governments around the world, um, they talk to each other and they agreed on um, a list of goods that should be controlled because these goods can be used for both good and for military purposes. And you can think about stuff that um, uh, makes very um, uh, nano chips, or even aluminium tubes that could be used both for construction but also for making rockets. Um, uh, chemical goods that, that um, can be used to, to make explosives, or any kind of stuff. Um, and we should actually know about this because this document is what started the crypto wars uh, in the 90s. And actually, it's still there. What they introduced back then is they, they so the, the, the process is they agreed we have to um, sync on, on uh, goods that are um, dangerous or for dual use goods. Uh, and the idea is that if you, if you make this kind of stuff and you want to export it to a different country, even uh, countries that are uh, in the Wassenaar arrangement uh, and, and talking to each other, then uh, you have to apply for a license. And um, you apply for a license, you go to the government saying, I want an export license, and six months later, uh, you get a, a license to actually export it to a certain uh, organization in another country. So for a certain client, you get one license. Or if, you're, if, you're, if you do your paperwork right, then you can get a, a, a big license uh, saying, 
uh, you can export to these kinds of organizations in these kinds of, uh, in this in this list of countries. So you get a more of like a blanket uh, st um, uh, agreement. But um, in the 90s, they introduced this, uh, and this says that any symmetric algorithm with a key length in excess of 56 bits, yes or an asymmetric algorithm where the security of the algorithm is based on one of the following, factorization of internet in, inter, integers in excess of 512 bits. 512 bits. If you do more than 512 bits, you have to apply for an export license and the government has to, um, has to judge whether they want to allow you to export this or not. What happened in the crypto wars is that this is actually still there. This is still current law. Um, but they put in a, an exception um, saying that if this is open source, if this is freely available, uh, or this is an academic research and, and uh, uh, published, then you can actually ex export it because anybody can get it and it doesn't make any sense to... Uh, uh, to export it. So we, we, we have crypto because everything is open source. If you have closed source crypto, you have to apply for an export license. Um, this is finally being reconsidered. Yes? Which countries will this apply? <coughs> okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. The, um, the question is, in which countries does this apply? Um, <coughs> you can look at the, the website, wassenaar.org. Uh, because it's 41 countries, and I don't know all of them. It's most Western countries. Um, uh, actually, uh, Russia, uh, Ukraine are also in there. Um, I don't think China is in there. Uh, Israel has a special status. They are not part of the, the agreement, but they do follow it. They, they, they do implement it. So it's most, most countries that, that you normally deal with. Um, so, why is this relevant? Well, this is relevant for vulnerability disclosure because um, some time ago they introduced this clause that says systems, equipment, components specially designed or modified for the generation, operation, or delivery of communication with intrusion software. So, anything that has to do with intrusion software. And then intrusion software, oh, and um, uh, also, technology for the development of intrusion software. Then, what is intrusion software? That is software specifically designed to avoid detection uh, or to defeat protective countermeasures. So if you break security, then it's probably uh, intrusion software of a computer or network capable de the device. Um, and. Uh, um, to do extraction of data or to modify the standard execution path uh, of a program. I have no idea what the standard execution path of a program is. Um, and if we wouldn't be able to establish what the standard execution path is of a regular program, then we'd be out of a job because then the security problem is solved. Um, so in, in essence, this was put in by people that made uh, fancy statements that sounded good and um, seemed like they were talking about security when actually they were not that well informed. Um, and oh, they, they, they said hypervisors, debuggers, etc. Et yeah, they, they might follow this kind of definition, so they're excluded. Um, and uh, asset tracking, uh, and for some reason, smart meters. They're excluded as well. I have no idea why. Um, how does this work? So, <clears throat> oh, um, let's see uh, how does this work. This was actually introduced in 2013, and the, the, the reason leading up to it was the whole situation in, uh, with, around the Arab Spring, where all of the governments were using spyware to monitor on the dissidents that they were... Um, uh, they, were, they were causing the Arab Spring. So all of the countries said, they're using all kinds of software that we don't want them to use, and the only way that we can actually stop them from using that is by using export control. So 
They went to the drawing table. They didn't bother to, um, to consult with all of the security people. And they just made legislation and said, yeah, this, is, this sounds good, so we'll do this. Um, so in 2013, they introduced the definition of intrusion software. The deal is that um, the EU implements this as regulation one year after an agreement in the Wassenaar arrangement because all of the European countries um, are part in of the, the Wassenaar arrangement. Uh, they don't want to do another discussion, so usually this is just uh, hammered uh, into law. Um, so on the 31st of December in 2014, there was an update of the EU regulation. Um, and it's still there. So this means that um, it may actually be that vulnerability disclosure um, is, uh, is, is covered under this, uh, this uh, list of intrusion software. Because the whole idea of technology, I didn't explain that, but technology for the development of intrusion software, that means um, anything that you need for the development of intrusion software, including knowledge. So the transfer of knowledge, if, so, um, like I'm talking here to you, because you are of different nationalities, this is export, actually. And if I were to describe a security vulnerability, and so the previous talk was a uh, description of how to own um, uh, um, CPEs, so modems, and he included a POC. And if you read the definition in a certain way, if you could interpret it in a certain way, he would have actually needed an export license in order to present it here. Um, so that is something that um, wasn't well received in the US, actually, because the US was a little bit late in implementing this. And in the summer of uh, 2015, for reasons that there was some disagreement within the government of the US and uh, the Chamber of Commerce or Department of Commerce actually made the most wildly in wildly um, uh, uh, strange interpretation of the Wassenaar rules so they included the, the term zero day in actually like in actual legislation uh, hacking um, uh, all kinds of different terms um, so they included the, the whole um, worst case interpretation of the Wassenaar arrangement. And then all of the technology companies that did uh, vulnerability disclosure, like Facebook, Google, all of these companies in the US, they went apeshit. So there were thousands of responses on the consultation of the implementation in Wassenaar. And what resulted was actually that the, the um, Congress in the US told the government to go back to Wassenaar and, and say, you have, to, you have to rediscuss this. We're not going to do this. Um, it took a while. For, unfortunately, the whole process in Wassenaar is very, very, very long. It took a while, and it looks like um, this may be resolved in Wassenaar at the end of this year, and then it would be solved in the EU at the end of next year. Um, meanwhile, the Dutch government uh, holds the interpretation that this that vulnerability disclosure is not um, uh, should not be covered by the idea of intrusion software. So in the Netherlands, you're safe. And I think in most European countries, you're probably safe. But still, they can they could go back and uh, and bite you with it. Um, I've been talking about vulnerability disclosure a lot. Um, the, the whole idea of the vulnerability disclosure in the Netherlands is that there's a couple of uh, building blocks and how you do this. And the idea is, is, on one hand, you have the promises of the organization, the CVD policy. And on the other hand, you have some responsibilities or, or guidelines for the behavior of the researcher and hacker. <coughs> um, and they have to work together. And if they do, then you come up with, a, with an optimal process that the hacker can securely notify an organization of a security vulnerability. Um, the organization can, can fix it. And then in the end, the, the researcher, once it's fixed, he can publish 
um, and it can go out the world uh, or presenting at conferences, uh, etc. Um, the Dutch Public Prosecution Service actually thought that this was a very good idea. Um, and since, th since the implementation in 2013, there have been two cases, two court cases, where the idea of responsible disclosure or co coordinated vulnerability disclosure has been named. Um, in both cases, the organization affected did not have a uh, vulnerability disclosure uh, program in place, but the judge still used the guideline as a, as a measurement stick for the behavior of the hacker, uh, the, of the discloser. Um, and I'll go through the cases. So, but before I go through the cases, I have to stress, so there has been no case whatsoever of a company that had a uh, vulnerability disclosure program in place against a um, security researcher. We don't know of any. Um, and the public prosecution service is actually very happy with this, with this idea because it saves them a lot of work. Um, so, the cases. Um, there are two. Um, the first one is the, the Groen Hart Hospital, is a hospital in the Netherlands. Um, they had a vulnerable FTP server with a easily brute forceable administrator password. Um, in green 2000. Um, they, the hacker found the vulnerability, the vulnerable system, and he informed the journalist because he was afraid of reporting it directly to the organization. But we have some uh, protection of the press, so a journalist is considered a, a reasonable source uh, as a way of disclosing this to a company. The journalist informs the hospital at 10 a.m. on, I believe, a Saturday morning. He actually published the story at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, and this was because the company in question just had a uh, crisis management training just the week before. Um, and so they, they got this telephone call from the, from the journalist they went into panic. They started their crisis management uh, stuff because they had just had the training and they knew what to do. And one of the first things that they wanted to do is put out the stress, uh, press statement. And of course, the journalist wasn't happy because that would ruin his scoop. So when he heard that the company was going to issue a press statement, he just published his story at, at 3 p.m. So that's why he published. That's why there was a very short disclosure timeline. Um, after this happened, uh, the, the hospital reports the case to the police. Um, the hacker in this case, he used the port scan tool and um, he had access for at least two weeks. Um, uh, he was obfuscating that access by using a VPN. He probably retrieved the, the password hashes and brute forced all of the other passwords or at least, at least tried to do that. Um, he shared some of the credentials that he found with other other people. So he bragged it to them on chat and IM and uh, etc. And he shared uh, the credentials. Um, to go even further, he installed malware on the, on the, uh, one of the servers to get um, uh, persistent access. Uh, but he was using his own IP for that, uh, not uh, not a VPN. So he, he made a mix up. Uh, he made a mistake. He downloaded multiple medical files from the organization, the hospital, um, including those he was, he was looking directly for some of the famous Dutch pe persons and downloading those files uh, and looking at them and maybe even sharing them. Um, and he sent screenshots of those files to the journalist. Finally, in his defense, he states that these were, um, that his actions were done in the, in the public interest. When the judge looked at this case, the public prosecution, the judge looked at this case and said, yes, the public prosecution service has a discretion to, uh, to prosecute this, uh, because the, the, the way this works is the public prosecution's office has issued a statement saying, we won't prosecute in this kind of cases uh, when people follow the responsible disclosure guideline. Um, so one of the first statements that the judge made is, yes, you, you, 
these actions are so are blurring the line of what is acceptable that you can actually uh, prosecute and try to figure out whether he crossed the line or not. The, um, the judge will have to judge whether the actions of the reporter, the, the ethical hacker, were proportionate at a subsidiary. Um, he emphasized in his verdict that revealing, public, uh, revealing security vulnerabilities can be in the public interest, um, especially uh, when we're talking about medical files. Um, he also found that there was no other way for the hacker to discover their vulnerability, um, which also meant installing the malware was actually acceptable um, uh, to show that the, the hospital had very weak security. The hacker accessed the data and downloaded data multiple times, and that is, is unacceptable and not necessary to show that you actually had access. You don't have to do it multiple times. Uh, and you don't have to download data of famous people, and you don't, sh you shouldn't share that with others. That's the whole idea of uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure. In the end, he was sentenced to 120 hours of community service. Uh, so we, this was a um, reasonably light statement uh, for what he actually did. He, he broke. So the judge said, "You, you, this was not." Um, following the ideas of the responsible disclosure policy. The other case um, involved this famous hacker person, Henk Kroll. <laughs> um, he's not actually a hacker, although he has talked at, uh, at hacker conferences at some point, but um, he's actually he's a politician um, and he's a journalist. Um, but he, in this case, it was also about a medical uh, organization, Diagnostique for You, um, which did, dealt with um, psychological uh, research about uh, people. Um, and in this case, um, there's a reference there also, if you want to look that up on the internet. The disclosure is a politician and a journalist, like I mentioned. He's uh, Henk Kroll. Um, an acquaintance of him discovered a vulnerability uh, no, he discovered the login and password of um, a medical system. He just shoulder, shoulder surfed it and uh, looked at people uh, of, and um, uh, logged in and looked at records and, uh, and all kinds of other things. Um, so he did some reconnaissance. He prints a few files. He actually, in in first instance, when he printed those files, he anonymized them. Um, and... Um, he calls the, uh, the help desk of the, uh, of the company, saying, yes, um, you, you have very poor security, and you should do something about it. The help desk has no idea what's going on. They, they are completely caught by surprise. They have, no, uh, they have no idea what responsible disclosure is. They have no idea what security stuff should be. They have no direct line to the security team. Um, so. They actually did something sensible, and they said, please write a report to us and send it to us, and then we can figure out what's going on and what we can do. Um, the disclosure is actually not happy with this, and he, he thought that they, they should have acted more um, and more decisively, but, so he calls a local TV station and tells them about his findings. He actually goes on camera, with a few journalists demonstrating that he can log in and on camera showing medical files uh, that he has access to. So, um, the verdict in this case, the judge stressed again that the disclosing vulnerabilities of sensitive medical system can be in the public interest, in the general interest. Um, it was reasonable to test these initial findings in practice, so it, it, you, you are allowed to log in and do some rec reconnaissance it's defensible that you print uh, medical files and anonymize them to show that you've actually had access, to demonstrate to the organization that you're not talking shit. Um, and the judge used a three-part test in light, um, in light of the Article 10 of the um, Europe European Convention on Human Rights, uh, the freedom of expression and information. Um, the disclosure should act in the general interest, the dis disclosures should act proportionately, and he should act in the least uh, invasive way. 
And um, portionality, it wasn't necessary to review the files with a journalist on camera. That's just, he just crossed the line there. Invasiveness, there was also no reason to go to the media directly. Um, there was no big vulnerability that everybody could uh, exploit because they shoulder surfed the credentials um, and there was no indication that other people had access to those credentials even though they were not that um, complex, but still. Um, and the judge also thought that the suspect should have taken more effort to contact the responsible partner. Um, because he's a member of, he was, uh, is again a member of parliament um, and he's a journalist, it, it's reasonable to expect him to, do, to, uh, to take more effort into actually contacting the, the organization and getting the right people um, and um, to actually talk to them and um, uh, get this fixed. The result was just a fi $1,500 fine. But it still was a statement saying, you crossed the line uh, and this is not acceptable. Um, and it was very helpful to us to say that the judge actually very clearly identified where he crossed the line. Um, there are multiple, multiple cases where um, companies are actually doing this in a positive way. Um, and I've highlighted one because it's, it shows that the, the company in question did a complete turnaround. It's uh, the Dutch telco, the KPN. They've actually been owned very badly at some point, um, and that caused them to completely think about their security, rethink their security, and they actually published um, a vulnerability disclosure program as part of their complete rehaul of the security. And one of the things that happened is that they actually got a report uh, that was very successful because two hackers found vulnerabilities in, in CPEs, the modems, um, these were widely used. Um, it may have been this, the vulnerability that the previous speaker was talking about. I don't know. Um, but the vulnerability could be used for, for DDoS attacks and to uh, gain access to the CPEs and to actually intercept data of all of their customers. Um, they give remote access. The hackers, in this case, acted, acted um, very cautiously, and they only tested this against their own equipment. So did, they didn't test it in, into, uh, in any of the third-party equipment, uh, and they reported the vulnerability to KPN. KPN, in this case, takes up the report. They, um, after doing some initial research, after acknowledging the, the initial report, um, they actually invited the hackers to, to the office because the, the actual vulnerability seemed to be very complex and they couldn't really understand from the report what was actually going on. So they invited the hackers to actually give a presentation to the security team on how they did their research and what they actually found so that they could actually start fixing it. They managed to fix this within a very short amount of time. Um, the hackers were awarded with KPN goodies and they were also um, uh, allowed and even sponsored, I think, to go to a uh, conference, um, and I think this was HackLu that they actually presented this. Um, and KPN furthermore used this as an outward statement highlighting that they take ser security seriously uh, and they invite others to do the same. Um, they released a press statement and um, made a video with all of the hackers to, uh, um, to actually um, promote this idea. And KPN is also one of the partners that was in the uh, manifesto that I uh, mentioned earlier. So that is basically what I wanted to talk to you about. One of the last things that I want to highlight is um, I mentioned earlier that there was this research by the NTIA about research and motivation. Uh, they had about 400 people who actually responded to the survey. And one of the questions was, what motivates you to actually do the research? This was a um, multiple option answer. So the answers add up to way more than 100%. 14% um, of the researchers wished to remain anonymous. Only 15% expected a compensation for their work, even if the company does, doesn't have a, a statement saying that they actually pay for this. 
Um, 53% expect at least an, an acknowledgement, and 57% uh, they just want to help. They want to help fix stuff, even if they're not paid. And the most important one is 70% of, of, uh, of disclosures, they expect to be regularly uh, communicated because they can't see what is going on inside of an organization when, they, when they're fixing stuff. So the organization should really reach out to the disclosures to keep them updated about, uh, about the process and, what, and uh, stuff that they should do. The key takeaways that I have that I hope you got from this is there are governments that are taking uh, vulnerability disclosure seriously. There are more and more governments in Europe that are actually doing this. Um, the, uh, Belgium has issued a statement that they want to do this. Uh, France has some kind of legislation. The Italians are actually thinking about imp implementing this. There has been um, uh, talk about this in Hungary. Um, and um, yeah, like I mentioned, the US also has now a, an official statement on how to actually do this. Um, the court cases in the Netherlands have shown that you, if a company publishes a vulnerability disclosure program, or even if a government uh, uh, states that they uh, uh, support the idea of vulnerability disclosure, it doesn't give you ha security researchers a carte blanche in doing anything in completely owning the, the organization, there are limits to what you can do in coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Um, and uh, in the Netherlands, we see that more and more organizations actually really appreciate this idea and they cherish the involvement of you, uh, the security researcher community. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. We have uh, about, uh, about 20 minutes for Q&A, so please line up at the mic and uh, take it away. One thing, one thing that I want to add, sorry. Um, so the, the guideline that we made in the Netherlands has, has been published in 2013. We're actually reviewing that document because it's, it's a little bit dated uh, and we're re reviewing it, rewriting it, uh, and we hope to publish that uh, somewhere at the end of this year. Um, so if you have any comments on how to improve this, I'd be happy to hear them or just after this talk. My um, credentials are, uh, the ways to contact me are down there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I mainly want to go into the Dutch issue. Um, yeah. Actually, if a, a company doesn't have a, a responsible disclosure uh, uh, policy published, uh, yeah. I as a security researcher am not uh, covered by the law. I can still be... Uh, well, suit. Shouldn't we fix that? I mean, it, it, it didn't happen yet, but it could happen, right? Well, what I wanted to show with the two court cases that I, that I mentioned, the two organizations didn't have a vulnerability disclosure program in place. And the judge still used the ideas of the vulnerability disclosure program as a measuring stick for, um, uh, for the behavior of the security researchers. So if you act within the guidelines of the vulnerability disclosure program, then the public prosecution office doesn't see any reason to prosecute you. Yeah, although uh, in the current re responsible disclosure policy, it's like that I cannot uh, download any information from a server. Uh, and, and actually, in this court cases, they went a bit broader than that. Yeah. Uh, so shouldn't the, that part be fixed? Because if, if I, the, I recently found a semi-open uh, FTP server and I thought, yeah, what's on it? Uh, yeah. Let's download it. But then I'm already in violation according to the responsible yes. disclosure. And well, I actually got into trouble with the company. And yeah, well, the idea wants, is that yeah. you do the minimum possible to show that there's a vulnerability. Um, so for, for an FTP server, then if you just do a directory uh, listing uh, and show what kind of files there are, and if you... Um, if you can already guess by the file names what's in those files, then you can probably use that as a, as a statement saying, here, I have access to your customer database and that's not good. For, I mean, for databases, if you get like a MySQL access or, or something similar, if you just get the row headers, then you show that you have access without down downloading any sensitive data. Yeah, okay, okay. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, and shouldn't we shield the disclosure, uh, the, the security researchers? So maybe have an organization set up with uh, 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 national security. Uh, so we so we actually try to do this with with the policy. If you still feel that you're not protected enough, or that the, the company that that um, uh, if you think that the company will take aggressive action against a security researcher, then you can contact us, uh, the NCSC. Um, to do the disclosure. You only do that for vital sectors, right? Uh, no. Um, but the, the, I mean, we, for vital All sectors and the central government, we, we are the, the first point, point of contact, or for most of the companies, we are actually the first point of contact. And if something goes wrong, we're responsible for um, dealing with the issue. Um, if you uh, found a, find a security vulnerability in any, in any other kind of organization and you reported it to them um, and you at least tried and it doesn't work out, then we can try to help. Okay, because yeah, my, my finding is and that of friends that, that we find a lot of shit and every time we report it, it yeah, goes we, we bad have, and, and yeah, we just stopped reporting it. Yeah, so, I, can, uh, yeah. I can understand. I mean, we have limited cap uh, capacity. We can't fix the, the security of every company in the Netherlands. Uh, but if it's very serious, if it affects a lot of people, then we will at least try. Thanks. Yeah. I think so it's, it's good to know that things are relatively civilized in the Netherlands. Can you give an overview of what is happening in other countries? Uh, all the rest of Europe, United States, China, Japan, like yeah. more economically developed. Yeah. And the related question is, what is a reasonably safe conduct in other countries? Because the laws and practices vary a lot. Yeah. So how, how do you stay on the safe side if you are doing this in other countries? And also, third question, what happens when the hacker is in one country or a security tester, security research is in one country and yeah. the company is in another country? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an international lawyer. Um, there has been a publication, so far it's only been in Dutch, and we're trying to get it translated, of what happens if you're a Dutch researcher and you try to report a vulnerability in Germany. Um, and it could be that um, if the company in Germany is really pissed off, then it, you could be in danger of jail time in Germany. Um, but that's very special circumstances, and I don't think that that's actually going to happen. But in, in theory, it could happen. And something similar like that could happen in other kinds of countries, especially in Europe, where there's all kinds of agreements between different countries on how to deal with these um, international issues. But uh, to come back to your first questions, the developments in other countries is that they are seeing the light that um, the, the path of the Netherlands has shown them. Um, I was completely surprised by the, the, the U.S. Department of Justice putting out this framework just last week because I, I thought that they were really not a fan of this whole idea, but they, they actually did. And they actually outlined some very good ways of companies to actually um, safeguard uh, security researchers from uh, prosecution by the companies, but also by the government. Um, and uh, I mentioned before the, the Belgians, the, the France, uh, Italy, uh, Hungary, um, Estonia, uh, those kinds of countries are seeing the light and they're, they're doing stuff. Um, in relation to China, it's difficult. There, there, there used to be some kind of uh, disclosure platform there, um, which had a uh, pretty progressive fixed publication date of 90 days. So you, you reported it there, the organization was notified of the, the vulnerability, and after 90 days, no question, the, the, the stuff was published. Um, the weird thing is that last year, the, the, that organization that was responsible for maintaining that platform and the platform with it, disappeared off the map. It seems that they pissed off the wrong people and uh, disappeared. I have no idea what happened. But um, similarly, but, uh, uh, on the other hand, the, um, uh, the Chinese network manufacturer, Huawei, 
um, they actually have a disclosure program in place. So even in China, this idea is, is accepted. Um, and they seem to be making the right movements. Um, and um, uh, there are others here who have more uh, um, experience disclosing internationally. He's sitting right there. And he may ha help you. Uh, if you want to discuss that, I'm, I think he'd be happy to tell you his experiences in, in doing that. Does Excellent. that answer your questions? Uh, yes, more or less. I just can try to add my understanding that if you want to stay on a safe side, you, you don't want to hack anybody else's no. network. If you want to show that a piece of equipment, say, has a vulnerability, buy that piece of equipment and hack inside your own lab. Yes. Then you are on a safe side. Yes. But because even then, no data is compromised. But even then, you're, that doesn't mean you're protected in every country in the world, unfortunately. Or even in that case, you can get successfully get sued and yeah. held responsible. Yeah. But that's bad. I'm, Next, afraid, uh, I'm afraid that that's the case. Yeah. Okay. Next question, uh, please. Hi. Um, when a company has uh, a vulnerability disclosure program, and it uh, explicitly uh, states uh, you are not to allowed to do this. For example, you are not allowed to use automated uh, scanners. And you use them and yeah. find vulnerabilities. Um, is it legal or isn't it? It will depend on the case. Um, and this is a very lawyery answer, uh, but it will depend very much on the... On the um, uh, on the consequences of what that happens. They, usually companies put that in place because they're afraid that their equipment is going to fall over if, if every hacker around the world is going to scan their whole network. Um, and it will. I mean, if, you, if everybody starts scanning everything, then, then things fall over. Um, if you do that in a sensible way and um, uh, you, do, uh, you do this in the least invasive way possible, then I think you're, you're probably on the safe side, but you shouldn't do this everywhere. Okay, but yeah. you are on the safe side, but um, imagine the, the company is still mad and reported it to the police. Yeah. Um, well, then the same thing applies, like I mentioned in the, in the court cases, if you acted responsibly, then the public prosecution office is probably not going to prosecute. Um, uh, yeah. That's, that's the best answer I can give you. Okay, thank you. Next question, please. Development of, of responsible disclosure in the Netherlands was, uh, yeah, happened uh, from a lot of different fronts uh, at the same time, like the yes. media attention and politicians. And can you, can you uh, oh. push up the mic uh, a little bit? Yeah, awesome. Uh, there was a lot of attention on the, the, the subject from different fronts, like uh, media attention, the civil servants, like NCSC, or uh, also big companies who, uh, who gave a, a good yes. example. Yes. Is there anything from, from, diff from different countries to, to uh, do to improve the situation? So. Um Yes, so uh, uh, we should be really thankful to you also because you did a lot of uh, hard work for, uh, for the situation in the Netherlands. Um, but I think that that process also showed that it takes, a, um, it takes broad support within a country to actually make this into a policy. Um, and this, I, I think that this actually happened in the US as well, where there are a lot of companies in Silicon Valley which already had disclosure programs and even bug bounty programs, they're paying researchers to do this. Um, and they were saying, we would really like this to be legal because we want more of these kind of reports. Um, I've had discussions with uh, the policy departments in the Netherlands and all kinds of other uh, uh, lawmakers about how we would approach this in Europe. And I've advised them against making this regulation in Europe making vulnerability disclosure programs mandatory in, in all of Europe is not going to make this uh, into a better place. What really should happen is that we talk to the, uh, the governments, that we talk to all of the international corporations uh, and organizations, and we talk to the security community, 
to make everybody receptive to the idea that this is possible. And once a country reaches a certain level, then they will automatically start looking to other countries that are doing the same thing. Hopefully look into the documents that we published, that the GCCS published, that the, the, the American government published, and they will see that the, there is a lot of help already out there in how to do this and how to implement this and how to make this, these kind of uh, processes so that this, it actually works in the right way. And we now have a couple of years showing that this is actually very successful uh, and that everybody is happier now that this is uh, uh, possible. Thanks. We have uh, time for one more question. So if anyone's interested, I see a hand. Running. And uh, please eat the microphone. Uh, the people watching the stream will be very thankful. Hi there. Hi. Um, I do quite a lot of physical vulnerability research. And it seems that the physical world is lagging well behind the digital world. There's no such thing as vulnerability disclosure programs. Nothing like that, no bug bounties. I was wondering, is there any way we can sort of push those, push the physical security industries the same sort of way as the digital security industries are going? Yeah. Um, how, how, how do you drive that, you know? Because a lot of the companies don't want to know. No. But, so the, um, the, the physical companies that are, um, responsible, that are doing software um, are usually lagging behind in all of, all of the developments, and they are unfortunately also uh, behind in the developments of vulnerability disclosure. Um, one exception is uh, car manufacturers. The car manufacturer lobby actually put out a statement saying, we take responsibility for all of the software that's in cars. Um, and that's actually a pretty big step because there are hundreds of vendors um, supplying uh, equipment, uh, parts, and software for uh, cars, and um, the the car manufacturer taking responsibility themselves for coordinating vulnerability disclosure is actually a big step because they um, uh, so they own they own the process and they're actually very receptive to it, and. Um, one of the things that happened in the US before the idea of the vulnerability disclosure is they have the, the Digital Millennium uh, Copyright Act that's loathed here. But one of the good things that's in there is that every once in a while it's reviewed. And um, uh, one of the reviews happened last year and they put in an exception for uh, cars and medical devices. Um, so. As a security researcher you, in the US, you were already allowed to research cars and medical devices. Um, um, the FDA in the, in the US has also taken a, a big step saying that if a company is a medical company is, becomes aware of a, uh, a security vulnerability in a medical device and they are able to fix it within 90 days, they don't have to do a recertification. So those kind of nudges uh, in policy or in regulations can really help make other kinds of uh, organizations ac um, uh, receptive to the idea of vulnerability disclosure. And I, I'm seeing that more governments are starting to realize that this is actually a way to go, that we have to help other kinds of organizations um, that have to do with physical devices um, to, to help to make them more receptive to vulnerability disclosure because physical devices tend to um, be a risk to people when they become vulnerable. And that becomes very serious very quickly. Uh, and we need to get that shit fixed. Thanks. Thank you, Jeroen. Let's give uh, Jeroen a warm hand.